Hello, everyone. Okay. So uh, there was there was once a little rat, and uh, this rat was running through a maize field, and maize stalks are very tall, and he just could not find his way out, and he kept running, and he kept running, and he didn't know how to get out. And then he saw an owl on the tree, and he looked up at the owl, and he said, can you give me some advice? Can you tell me the way out of this maze? So the owl says, I have an idea for you and a good strategy. Why don't you grow some wings like me, and then you can fly above the maze, you can spot where you want to go, and that's the solution. So I said, oh, that's great. And then he stopped and he said, wait a minute, but how do I grow wings? And the owl said, I only do strategy, I don't do detail. <laughs> so, so that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. My name's Phil Abernathy. Uh, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, but uh, yeah, Bangalore was originally my home, so it's great to be here. And uh, I work with a number of organizations, taking them on the Agile journey. So I grew gray on waterfall and then moved over to Agile uh, about 12 years ago. So the last two, having done a lot of my journey with the companies like Suncorp and the others in uh, Australia, has been more focused at the top end, and I'm going to share my experiences with you as to where Agile is going in the next, uh, in the next uh, let's say, few years. So the journey that I'm going to look at is actually looking at what is the problem that organizations, specifically large organizations, medium to large, actually face today. What's the problems? And we see it every day, and it's the same problem, by the way. And then what's the impact? So what? Because if it's not an issue, let's just move on. We don't have to worry about it. But this problem, and this is, this is something I noticed, and I said, this problem has been around for ages. It's not something new. So what have we done about it to date? And has it solved the problem? If it hasn't solved the problem, how come it hasn't solved the problem? Over the years, it's the same problems. And then what could we do, and where could we go after that? So I'm going to run through it quite fast now. If I look at the actual problems, this problem, and I can tell you 30 years ago when I was working for Shell, these are exactly the problems we faced. How many of you face these problems in one way or another? One or more of them. We've almost got 100% going up there. Too much work, pressure to deliver, usual things, missed targets, and it's just the pressure in there. So if you put it more positively, so let's not be a negative, let's be positive, and you look at it, yeah, we've got to do more with less. We've got to deliver better, faster, deliver cheaper, and create a great place to work. Now, people say, oh, well, the goalposts have moved over the years, and things have changed. Technology has changed. But these problems haven't changed. They're still the same problems that organizations are facing. Agile or no agile? And I'm talking about agile organizations facing these problems. So what, what's, really, what's really happening there? So let's just, would you say that we do have a problem? Would you agree? There is a problem out there. That's why we're all here. We're trying to solve this problem. So where do we go? So let's just look at so what. Yeah? Is, is, maybe it isn't a problem. Yeah? Maybe it's just the symptoms we're feeling. Yeah? So let's just look at the problems. We've got things like waste, lower productivity, high cost, low morale, missed targets, and most of all, unhappy customers in many, many cases, and of course, lower profitability. The number of companies that go bankrupt are tremendous uh, in terms of percentage. There's about 70% of small and medium enterprises after two years, they're pretty much, yeah, in trouble. So, we do have a problem, and it's not a, happy not a happy solution, like the impact is quite strong. So what have we done about it till now? Let's look at that. So I'm going to play you a little video, yeah? Because I think this video talks about one of the things that we have always done and continue to do. So you will recognize a bit of this, yeah? I'm going to blow it up a little bit and see if there's good audio coming across. So, 
I thought, I thought that, um, that really represented some of the solutions that people take to this problem. How many of you have more than one reorganization a year in your organization? Yeah. We've got more than half going up. It's a constant thing. It's a constant. Let's reorganize. Yeah? So, but there are a few other things that we do besides reorganization to address those problems. Yeah? We've got new systems, new tools. Uh, or what about TQM? Let's put in TQM. You know? There's a total quality management system. There's team building. We go about and build bridges and do those nice things. There's, of course, a HR campaign. And, of course, we implement Agile and Lean. But the problem still remains. I've been working in an Agile organization uh, for years that, that's been very Agile and not a very big company as well. Still the same problem. So has it really helped? Has all these things? Well, it has improved. Let's be honest. If you go do a lot of the things, work lean, think about managing the funnel, everything, things, the flood has improved. But the problem still remains. Yeah? So how come? Oh, well, actually, one of the root causes is prioritization. And this has been there, as you can see, right from way back. Yeah, it's hard to prioritize. So let's just look at that a little bit. And there's so many oxymorons around the prioritization issue because we have this feeling that if we do more, we're actually getting more done, do more simultaneously. But great people like Liebig and, of course, Eliyahu Goldratt have always said that you, you do have to manage the scarcest resource. Yeah? You can only deliver as fast as your slowest bit. Yeah? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, okay. But I still need to do these things. So they've been through all this. They've been through all these trainings. We looked at things like this saying, oh, the colors have gone on that. But that's a pipeline in the middle, and that's a pipeline in the middle there. So, uh, you know, same number of balls, but if you do more at the same time, 100% utilization, the number of balls that come out at the other end in the same amount of time is going to be less than if you don't, that if you leave some gaps. Yeah? The whole highway scenario. You pack your highway, one little accident, highway's blocked. Yeah? So give it some space, and you know, like we do here, we can weave around on our scooters. Yeah, yeah, you've been there, you've been there. So, you know, you can find the way around. And uh, now, even Bangalore, isn't it? It's full. On a scooter, I'm in a traffic jam. So you think something, you know, something has to change there. So let's look at it. So we've got the portfolio, the program, and the project. Let's govern it. So we say, well, that's about doing the work right, and that bit is about doing the right work. Yeah? So you need both sides. And this is what governance is about managing the funnel. You've got to manage the top bit, doing the right work, and the bottom bit once it's approved. So we've got a solution for that. Over the years, we've mastered this solution. And that is the solution that we have. Yeah? The PMO. Yeah? Let's bring in the PMO. So we've now got a, a PMO that manages this funnel, and we've taken that to another level over the last two years. We've got the Agile PMO. This is people that work a bit faster and do things a bit more. And we talk about small batch size, and we talk about doing things in a better way. And I implemented, we went through with this one customer, the small teams, who, you know, Agile at the team level, went up further. These teams are struggling. Agile teams are drowning because of the work being pushed up. So let's get the Agile PMO. So implemented the Agile PMO. Now we've got a team that meets, that actually manages the funnel and schedule. But it's still, it's still not working. Yeah, there's something there, but it's still not solving the problem. The PMOs are struggling because the boss comes through at the end and says, I just want that done. Make sure you do it. Yeah, yeah, but, but you, you played the game the last time. It's very hard to say no. Just very hard to say no. So there's one more thing in the pipeline. Just start. We'll see about it. And so it goes. So we do have to go back to the root. So we went back with this team one level further and said, why is prioritization a problem? So let's go up to the root. What is above prioritization? What sits above that? Yeah. What, what, what do you all think sits above the prioritization layer? Well, corporate strategy. Yeah. So 
and say, yeah, wh what do you mean corporate strategy? I mean, we, we have strategy. Of course we've got a strategy, yeah? And we then visited the strategic teams, and I started working in this area about two years ago. And what became apparent when I asked the question, why? Why don't you have just two things you want to do in the next two months? Why are there always nine? Why? Yeah? I've got one team that I work with. They're around 60 people, 40 projects in flight at the same point, in some phase or the other. And they're agile. They're very agile. Yeah? Sounds like your company. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, sounds. <laughs> Correct. So something is not working. So yes, we have a strategy. So we said, what does your strategy look like? Let's bring it out. So go into the drawer and pull out the strategy document. That's been sitting there. You remember that one? It's been sitting there for a while. It's got a little bit of dust it, open it. Right, so what have we got? We've got statements in there that are very, very important statements. You know, let's focus on quality. Let's go offshore. Let's be the best. That's a strategic choice. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Haven't you seen this? How many have seen words like this in the strategy document? Look at this, look at this amazing response, yeah? So this is what I found in the documents. This is the strategy that they've put up there. So I said, so what is the problem? Okay, that's fine. Something is not working at the strategy level, obviously. So what can we do about it there? What can we do about it? So I said, what do you all do for strategy? How do you do strategy? We use Porter's Five Forces. And that's why this is called the We use Porter's Five Forces. I said, what do you mean? And Porter's Five Forces is a tool for analysis of the competitive marketplace. That's all it is. That is not how you do strategy. No, but we use Porter's Five Forces. OK, so I've got it up there for you. You can see what it looks like. So let's just look at what the perfect strategy should be. So this is another little video that I thought was quite, quite impressive. And I thought, this, hmm, this looks a lot like strategy in many places. <laughs> so is isn't that how strategy is sometimes? Let's just do something and first time it'll work. I can guarantee you, you know, you'll get away with it once. The next time you will definitely not get away with it. Yeah? So very often it's like this. You know, just a shot and hope that it works and pray. And people do pray. I tell you in corporates, they do pray. So then there's, we, we ask, what's the problem? What is really the problem in this prioritization? So these are the answers I got. And these are real answers from the teams. Yeah, the leaders are pulling in different directions because they've been bonused differently. Yeah, of course you want to get your job done because your bonus depends on it. And if you don't get the project in, you won't sell more, et cetera. The strategic choice, do I do project A or product A in the market or product B is not made at that top level. The actual choice is not made. Yeah, the people at the lower level are unable to link work to strategy. Yeah, then you've got, yeah, we, we don't really know exactly which way we're going. Is it that hill or is it that hill? But we are going that, that way, yeah? So there's a bit of ambiguity there. Of course, there's no buy-in with people involved in the strategy. A lack of smart goals, so specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely, no. Be the best. That's an example of a goal, yeah? Be number one, yeah? So nobody really knows, and there's communication, yeah? And disconnected from the budget process. This was very, very interesting. We found that people had a strategy cycle that did not link with the budget cycle, which was run by finance, yeah? And of course, you've got a nice strategy here, but the budget is not there to do it, yeah? Because you did the budget before the strategy. So all sorts of dysfunctions going on there. Now you look at what's come out, what's published by Harvard. So I went back to MBA material. I looked at Stanford. I looked at Harvard. I looked at INSEAD and said, what are these people teaching? Yeah? 
in, in how to run strategy. Forget about Agile, yeah? So this was from the 2010 Harvard Be Review. You cannot separate the, the formulation and the execution, yeah? If you don't, yeah, you'll get what is called the disengaged doer. You know, if, if you don't involve people, if you do not involve the entire company, but strategy is only for the boss. I'm just a little, you know, hamster somewhere there. I don't really know about this strategy thing. I just do what I'm told. So I've got a little video here from Michael Jarrett. Now, he's, he's a head in INSEAD that's really at the pinnacle of uh, MBA work and strategy work in that area. And this is not a funny one. So uh, he, he really talks about what strategy is. So I said, let's just look at it and see what they're teaching in these big schools. The good news is that strategy isn't doomed to failure if you take some basic steps. The first key to success is asking a question that is so basic that many companies never ask. It. Do you have the right strategy? To answer this question, you have to break it down into tangible elements. Can you clearly define the strategic goal and the target's market or products? Are your company's internal structure, activities and commitments aligned to support your strategy's goal? If you answer no, you need to rethink its plan. It's the foundation upon which everything is built, so you have to get it right. Your strategy should be created with a fair and open process. Otherwise, you risk the situation that Air France faced. Senior executives announced to its unionised workforce that to save the airline, it would have to lay off 2,000 people Institute a pay freeze. The unions went on strike and general mayhem ensued. But when the company sent a middle-ranking civil servant to poll the same union members on what they thought should be done, surprisingly, workers laid off 3,000, instituted a longer pay freeze and boosted productivity. The changes passed a union vote. What this illustrates is once a problem is identified, a solution created and vetted through a fair process it is more likely to get buy-in. Once you've got the strategy right and the people on board, your project management techniques need to be rolled out to make it work. Don't leave it to executives throughout your company to create their own implementation plan. Set up cross-functional project teams. Create actionable milestones and key performance indicators. Track your progress against them. Issue reports to key stakeholders. And hold people accountable to sticking to a plan. If you don't treat strategy execution as a real initiative, your company won't take it seriously enough to make the changes and sacrifices required. In sum, strategies don't form or implement themselves. People will resist change. But by embracing these ideas, you have a much better chance of making your strategy work. So you recognize some of the common themes there. So the collaboration, getting people involved, executing it like a project. And these just don't happen in companies at all. So when we looked at it again, we said there's definitely a problem in the strategy space. OK? So now let's ask one more why. So why is there a problem in strategy space? Yeah. So if you ask that question, you land up with leadership. Yeah? Leadership is at the heart of most of these issues, and in particular, strategic leadership. So what are they doing about it? So I asked this question in the workshops that I run. What percentage of leaders time, and I'm talking first line leader, middle management, and executive leaders, do you spend on strategy? What do you think the percentage was on average, on average? Uh, more than 30%? in the region of less than 30% was spent on strategy. In, and this is even at the executive level, yeah? So I said, hmm. So another HBR review, 
people say that there's an invisible line. These people work on strategy, and the rest of the management and the team and the people, they're not involved in strategy. They just have to do what is told. Yeah? Something is really not working. So we looked at strategic leadership and said, what's happening here, and now what can we do about it? So what is strategic leadership? So strategy has two parts to it, formulation and execution. And you have to address both. A leader can't say, well, I'm in this side of the fence, and I don't have to worry about execution because I'm high up. And the one down below can't say, I'm down here, and I don't have to worry about formulation. I just have to execute what they decide. It doesn't work that way. Yeah? And I'm going to explain why. So let's drill down a bit more. So to get good strategy, and this is reading good strategic material, seeing what's out there, pulling back on experience that I've had, you come up with this list. Yeah? So iterative, flexible, adaptive, focus. What does this look like? So wait a minute. Those are very much agile and lean principles in there. So let's look at the next half. Let's look at strategy execution. What's needed in there? You need buy-in. You need shared understanding. You heard the professor from INSEAD. You need an inclusive system. You need to execute it like a program of work, feedback, measured, focused. What does that look like? So why aren't we using Agile in this space? And how can we use Agile in this space? Because you can't go to them and say, now get Agile for your strategy. They'll kick you out most probably. Yeah? So the Agile practitioners, again, not very many of them are gray or bald. Yeah? So you need a certain amount of uh, age maturity to work at the exec level, and they don't allow you in unless you've actually been working in some role there. So it's very hard to get in there. But once you do get in, you're able to look at them and say, there are some things that need to be done in the strategy world that we can put a little framework around it. So I did not mention the A word or the L word. Yeah, don't mention it because immediately you get tarred with a brush and you're put in the corner. So say, so let's just look at strategy and see how we can improve it. So there are five steps you need in the formulation process. What's the purpose? So that has to be number one. Why do we exist? Yeah, as a company, as a department, whatever. Where are our goals? What are the drivers? And I'll talk about drivers. How do we do it? And the plan. And then we've got to measure, monitor, adapt very fast and feed back into that. So it's a continuous loop. It's starting to look a bit familiar, isn't it? So we put a little bit of a framework around it. Again, don't want to use the A word or the L word. Let's say, let's paint the future. Yeah, we called it prep. Let's build the vision, mission, goals, drivers. Let's look at retros, SWOTs, and challenges for the reality. What's the current phase? Let's evaluate the strategic options. Yeah, And let's look at uh, planning and scheduling the resources at a strategic level. And let's do it this way. So we'll get some cross-functional teams. Let's workshop it a little bit. Let's start using some sticky notes during the workshop so we get the wisdom of the crowd. Let's have a FedEx day for innovating key problems. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the FedEx day? Okay, a couple of them. So FedEx deliver, or at least pro promise to do. We aren't allowed to use this word, by the way, because they, they raised a bit of a stink, but who cares? So uh, they deliver in one day. So the idea is to get a team together, give them one day, and give them a problem, or let them select a problem. And by the end of the evening, they have to have a solution. And it works wonders, because they get really creative. So iterative loops for validating the hypothesis of the strategy use a lot of facts in preparation, and let's make some decisions there without coming out with we want to be the best. That's not good enough. Yeah? So we also had to understand drivers. So I use a technique called the $100 revenue uh, driver, which is key. And once you create this, it goes all the way down to the teams. So here's the example. The whole purpose of strategy in a, in a company that's for profit or even not for profit because they have to balance the book is to raise your revenue and reduce your cost. What's the gap in between revenue and cost? Your profit. Yeah, you've got to increase these two. So let's look at revenue. You've got $100 of revenue coming in. This is an insurance model. They're slightly, slightly changed numbers. 
So out of that $100, you spend $32 on paying claims, uh, $28 on commissions to sell the insurance, and uh, there's market costs, there's operations, and that's your operating profit. Now, on the other side, the team marks, what are the things they can change? High means, I, th that's got a high impact if I change it. Low means, mm, there's a low probability of changing it. The claims cost over the last 30 years has been in the average of 32%. So that's not going to change too much. Yeah? So then we said, OK, what if we, can we reduce that by 3%? Yeah, by $1. OK, what about reducing commissions by $1? What about market and sales by $1, $3? Operating costs. So now we've got a $7 operating profit link. And let's increase our revenue by 30%. So you're starting to see the, the the linkages between the two. And this is done with a cross-functional team right down to team level in different groups, in the departments. Yeah? Now, here's one for telco. So they'll have marketing, billing, admin. So just to give you an example that it works in any industry, including the software industry. So let's look at the drivers for claims. So what's behind claims? You have to take it down a level. So the drivers behind reducing claims is your reinsurance cost, your claims management cost, your incidents, and leakage. Leakage is fraud. Yeah? That's what claims is made up of. So we broke that apart, and we said we need to get 3.1%. Yeah? How do we, OK, we can reduce that by 2%, that by 1%. Fraud is a bit difficult. It happens all the time. It's there. So now we said, how can you change that? So let's renegotiate the contract for reinsurance. Let's create a single claims process and system because we've now got three systems and the claims cost is high. And let's put on some private detectives to save the 1% there. Yeah? Now, these are turning into your, your actual strategic. Oh, you can't read that very well. But what it says at the top there is those are the strategic initiatives. You're slowly turning your strategy into tangible initiatives. Let's do that. So now, in the claims management cost, 200,000 is that 1%, right? So if you can save 200,000, how much would you be willing to pay? If I, can, if I tell you you can get 200,000, how much would you be willing to pay for that? 50%? Yeah, 100,000? You see, our gut works very well. What is this really called? This is your cost appetite, your framework, your envelope for spend without doing any big feasibility study on how much your project can cost. You are not going to pay more than 50% because there's a chance of it going wrong. Yeah? So you're already deciding your feasible envelope for your expenditure for that project. Don't come back with a project of half a million dollars. Yeah? So you do the same for revenue drivers. Uh, online sales, oh, we need a full service media. We need new agents in Perth, and we're going to have an, a new product. So just examples. Again, there are some what is called must-win battles, and voila. Let's put the whole list together. What have you got here? Do you recognize this? This is your list of projects. This is what the PMO has been working for years trying to prioritize. And all of a sudden, you've got your priority because you've got your cost appetite. You didn't have to do any benefit studies and feasibilities for it. You know approximately how much you're willing to spend. Yeah? You know approximately the benefits, and you know how important it is to your business. So you're starting to get the first funnels. These are done by the executive teams, by the leaders, top down with the teams. So they've got representatives from the teams below. So that's the top bit. Now you've got to execute it, so because that's only one part of the funnel. So on the execution side, as I said, you measure, you adapt, you prioritize, and you steer. So let's use the drivers and blockers. Little technique, again, an agile technique to see what's working. Uh, let's fine tune, adjust, lean startup practices. Every two weeks, the strategy is reviewed. Where are we now? Where are we now? Review, are we on track? Have we met the measures? Let's go forward. You prioritize or reprioritize, and you steer. So the pieces are broken up now. 
So if you look at it, that group, that leadership group, the strategic leadership group, the executives, plus people from the lower teams, they're the ones who are actually driving governance, not some PMO. Yeah? And they're the ones who are actually assigning the monies and the budgets to this group. Now, let's say I've made an estimate that that project on the claim system was 200,000, you're willing to spend 100,000. Now, is that right? You, may, you don't know if it's right. So what you do is you do an agile concept. Some call it inception, some call it discovery, which is the first little agile loop, five-day workshop on using agile for the concept. If it passes, you're actually feeding that information back into the strategy group. And you say, oh my god, actually to change this is going to cost us $300,000. Stop it. Stop it immediately. All you spend is five days on it and put it back into the funnel and have the strategy conversation. Say, we can't change this. That's a wrong strategy. So you've tested it in a small little loop. If you need to do a spike, go down one step further. Yeah? And break it up into smaller pieces. Can we do just a part? So we're coming back to small batch size, driving it. Let's look at a two-month window and see what are the three things we can do for two months. Yeah? So you're starting to pull it down, but it all happens not from the PMO bottom-up level, but from the top-down level. If they're not on board, you will not get there. It's very, very hard. So execute your strategy like an agile project. So we've got the teams to put up the strategy cards in eight weeks. So that's uh, iterations of two weeks each yeah, for two months on the strategy wall and move the cards through. They've got big visual charts. Just to give you an example, this is drawn, and they've got measures to see the actual SMART goals changing. They've converted, oh, this is a terrible picture here. They've converted the entire strategy into a graphic that covers, they've got an artist in to draw it together with the team. And then what they did, this is amazing. I hope this is better. Ah, oh, this is better. So that's the picture that you saw previously. They had a competition for every child in the department and a coloring competition for the strategy picture. And they told them, color it, and we'll, we'll have a winner, and we'll award a prize. And there were around 40 kids. Almost everyone has some kids. And there was one guy who didn't read the email, and he did the coloring himself and sent it in. And he didn't win the prize, of course. But as you can see, you get everybody involved, because you now have to explain that picture to your children. Your wife's going to ask you, what's that, darling? And oh, well, or oh, your husband. Yeah? So it does, get, it does get everybody involved in it. And you get the feedback as you do this. And just saying, oh, well, we had a great strategy, but execution was a problem is, is really not on. You have to take care of execution. And now I come to the most important part of it. So that's all great, but everyone is still saying, yeah, but I'm, I'm so small. I'm in the organization. I'm really small. I don't have the power to, for strategy. But that's not really true because that, this picture, and again, I'm sorry about the lines and the colors, uh, is very, very important because strategy works at every level and there's a link between the levels. So here's the link. The strategy from the level above becomes the goal for the level below. Then you work out the strategy for that. The strategy for that level becomes the goal for the level below and so on and so forth. So let's take an example. Uh, we need to in improve and increase our revenue in selling insurance. Yeah? We've got to increase the insurance market. So that's the strategy there that uh, they talk about. And they say we are going to do that by targeting, uh, oh, which we did, housewives. So we're going to come out with something new for housewives and see if we can have a product for them. But that becomes the goal of the business unit that's looking after new product development. So they've got to come up now with a strategy for how to effect that goal. So they do all the workshops, and they do everything. And they came out with, we're going to build this new product that looks like this, and it needs, by the way, an IT system. So guess what happens there? That strategy has now become the goal of the IT department, which says, we have to build a system that has uh, X, Y, Z, for housewives, and if they fall and break your leg, you can get an insurance that somebody will come and clean your house. 
oh, this is a nice product. How do you build that? So they have a strategy, the IT team with everyone else, for building that product. That little strategy then goes to the web design team, who now have a goal to build the front end for that product. And they execute the strategy. So you can see the linkage. Strategy is not something, no matter how big your company, that you can do at one level. There is a cascading link. And it's not just, here's the strategy. So there was a story about uh, the CEO in, um, in the northern part of Australia that said, uh, we want to go to Western Australia, and it's a great idea, and we're going to just roll out this new product there. And the message went down to Western Australia, and they said, the ground level, that's real bullshit. They told their boss that, and that's how they talk as well. Uh, it's bullshit. So, well, they went back to the VP and said, the people are saying this is bullshit. He said, no, we can't say it's bullshit. So he went up to his boss and said, well, there's a lot of manure in this. Yeah, so it's, it's really a bit, yeah, a bit smelly, and it's not good. So the VP who took it up, the president took it up to the next person and said, well, you know, there's a lot of manure there, and uh, yeah, there's potential for growth. So the, it was fed back to the, to the group board that it's a very productive area that things can grow. So the same message twisted along the line, nice little thing, and it gets back up. Haven't you heard this before? Nicely twisted and, you know, like Chinese whispers. So this model, and this is not my model or someone's model, this has been there in MBA books for the last 15 to 20 years. But how many MBAs are in today's business? A few. How many actually practice it, the, the things they've learned? So it's our time now to bring it in, in a stealth form, without using the A and the L word, into models to actually start collaboratively linking these pictures in. So no matter at which level of the organization you are, you are doing strategy. You're doing strategy at every single level, down to the smallest team, and executing it. I'm going to skip that one. So <clears throat> I believe that strategic leadership, and I've used the sixth force analogy after Porter's five forces, really can make a huge difference to organizations as a whole. And this morning, I was just sitting there, and there was Jeff talking about the improvement carter. Have a look at this improvement carter. What do you think it is? Understand the direction, yeah, your vision, your mission, your goals. Where are we now? current position, establish the most specific smart goals, and then plan, do, check, act. Plan, do, check, act. The small, iterative, tight loops reflect, persevere, or pivot. So these cartas have been around in successful companies like Toyota and the others that went from the last, the lowest possible automotive company to beating General Motors and being number one. So what does it take 1955? How do you double the value of a Toyota? You put a full tank of gas in it. So the products coming out of Japan were really crap, and they focused, and it's a journey. And they're now the number one due to processes like this. This is not something that has been there overnight. So set your SMART goal and let, tell the teams, go figure at the level down. Here's your goal. Go and find the strategy. Then they go down a level and measure. Did you do, is it moving the goal? Yes or no. If it's working, continue. If it's not, hey, you better do something about it. Measure, and then move the goal further out. But we cannot do what we're doing today, which is actually delegate prioritization to PMOs or to someone else, and just say, you know, well, we've made the, go and prioritize. So we do have an issue there with strategic leadership. And traditionally, in summary, if you look at the way we've done it, you know, it's top down. It's, I've been out, I've actually been guilty of facilitating strategy days. And I'm sure many of you, even as agile coaches, have done that. And it will work fantastically. And the last two hours, when you really have to talk about some decisions, yeah, it's very rushed, and somebody's got the bag, and they're off for the plane ride. You know, the plane is there, and they're off. And the whole meeting just disintegrates. And the decisions are not made. So actually doing, uh, doing it in one workshop, the annual strategy off-site. How many of you have heard of that? Yeah? You do see it all the time. We're going for the off-site. They're away for two days. You never hear anything. And then they come back, and each leader gives you the message in a different way. So and you get this. You know, they're, they're looking through some glass, and they've got some carrots there, some bonuses, and 
you have to pull the cart. It's just not working. It's dysfunctional. And I think using some of the principles that we have learned and we know in Agile and Lean, just, I mean, Gembutsu, for example, just go see the real thing. Rather than sitting in the ivory tower and saying, you know, this will work in Perth, just go to Perth and talk to the people. Let the leaders go and see the thing as opposed to passing the messages down. Another thing that I've noticed is, and coming back to the owl and the rat story, Agile actually exposes the culture of Agile and Lean exposes the real problem. That in itself is one step in the right direction towards that. So doing the right work, if you look at portfolio governance and PMOs, I really think that should be replaced with strategic leadership. And that's where the key lies. And that, I would say, is the sixth force. That's my last call to action. So. Let's formulate a strategy together as we go in our little teams. And people say to me, well, you know, I'm not senior enough to make this change. You don't have to be. Just do it at your level. Ask your boss what's their strategy document for the division above. They'll give you something from there. And start it. Start the process. Have, call them in, call them down, and start using the techniques that you know at the strategy level and then take it down a level. Now, whenever you're executing it, just put it up on a wall. Put the strategy cards up on a wall and execute it like an agile project, which is what they teach at Harvard, at INSEAD, and at the London Business School. Execute it like an initiative. And with that, I'd like to end. Thank you very much. So yeah, I think I have time for a few questions. Yeah. Fail and uh, not taking action on time, uh, uh, more yeah. so, so I think the, the, the measurements, uh, having measurements like burn downs and all is, is OK. What, the thing that has worked the most, at the end of the day, you want that smart goal. Remember the 2% change in claims cost? From that, you have to break that down to the level that makes sense and have a measure. So let us say you've got. Uh, uh, 50% less defects is what we need. Well, measure your defects. Or we need to increase our salespeople contacting new customers. Have that as a target, and then measure that. So you see those realistic things. Yeah, I want to acquire a company. I've, I've incorporated that as part of my strategy, my product strategy. M&A. We're going for merger and acquisition. OK. So M&A team takes more time, and the value of that company is now higher, or double it. Now I don't have that purchase. Well, I, I think the M&A team have to make their own goals and targets, so take it down to them. Tell them, go and figure out how to do this. And then they have to have their own measures. They have to measure it. It's not measured top down. So you have to break down your measures right down to the level of execution. I think just common sense and having the measures in there as well. I don't know what is the uh, culture of measurement. I can tell you one thing, and the, the people in the audience from Australia help me here. Uh, we don't really have a culture of measurement. Yeah? Would you agree? Yeah. So it's, it's just something. And in other countries, I've worked in Holland a bit, and they really measure, 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 measure. But it takes to the other extreme. So you have to find the balance. So I think, I think the balance scorecard is nothing but one of the techniques, like Porter's techniques, uh, for identifying your SMART goals. So the balance scorecard, scorecard has four aspects. It's got financial, it's got customer, it's got process, and it's got people, to keep it simple. And you, you set yourself SMART goals on all four aspects so that you don't forget one. And that's just a tool, a framework that you can use in your workshops to develop strategy. Balance scorecard by itself is not a strategic tool. It's just a, a little frame that will help you. Uh, classically, we had uh, what is strategic, what is uh, tactical, tactical, what is operational, yep. with respect to spans of discretion at every level. Yeah. So what you're saying is that you have the same span of discretion at every level and everything is strategic. Yeah, because you know, the, the, 
yes, you've got BAU, so the, the systems have to run. So what we have is in the budgets, they've said 30% is BAU budget, and there's a Kanban system for identifying what has to be done there. Now let's talk about the 70%. Yeah? That 70% is strategic. Now, the tactical operational split has historically been purely a, a matter of time. So tactical is like nine months. Operational is like two months. And strategic is about three years. But that vision is going away and saying every, there is no such thing as operational, tactical, strategic, uh, unless you consider BAU fires, which we all have to put out, yeah, as operational. Tactical and strategic is, is just a simple loop of strategic, 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 but in small pieces. can go bottom up or top down as such in, in a hierarchical organization. And we had a beautiful talk this afternoon about uh, uh, socio, what was it called? Sociology and the other sort of forms of companies. And they will come or may come. Let's talk about hierarchical organizations. In a hierarchical organization, uh, the hierarchy, the drive will come from the top. But the top should not decide how the website should look at the bottom. Or the top should not decide how the product is going to be rolled out in Western Australia. Yeah? That has to be left to the level lower. Now, the way we do it is we include, and Fiona was included in some of these teams as well, the team that is, let's say the executive team, is having representatives from the two layers down. So the next layer has got representatives from one layer up and two layers down. And the layer down is one layer up, so that's a cross-functional team. So you've actually got representatives from right down from the working flow level. You cannot involve everyone. So that won't work because then you'll be there forever. So, yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. Thank you very much and hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>